It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, today, and uh, it's kind of hard to see everyone because of the bright lights, but uh, I'm reminded of the time I gave a talk at the National Institute of Standards, who's responsible for the strong cryptography that we use globally. Uh, they couldn't get the projectors to work the whole talk, the whole hour. And I was trying to talk and every, you know, they were constantly saying, oh, any minute. And there was all this psychedelic imagery appearing uh, on the screen the whole time I was trying to talk. So I guess I can, uh, I can speak here. But um, today, governments and corporations have most of our data and they insist that we identify ourselves in a ways that they prescribe in order to gain access to our own data, for the most part. So the way that this is uh, often described in the so-called security space is in terms of three factors. Something you know, like a password or uh, the like, something you have, like a government-issued identity document, for example, and as they say, something you are, which is a biometric in effect. And Today, we, you hear about two-factor authentication and, and, and so on. This is all about this, this paradigm of you being requested to or forced to identify yourself to these organizations in the ways they demand uh, in order to get a kind of access to your information. Well. It turns out, um, I think, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain is uh, leading the way towards uh, a new approach, a different approach that uh, actually I've been campaigning for since the late, very late 70s. And um, the irony is that, I think this is a, well, I guess there is no pointer on this. Um, the irony is, that these same phrases, something you know, something you have, something you are, can be applied in this new paradigm equally well, but with very different meanings. So now you create your own keys with your own equipment, you control exclusively access to your own information and so something you know can be thought of as perhaps the uh, private communication that you have with others, including who you communicate with and when, the so-called social graph, which is key information about yourself. And the something you have, I mean, we're all familiar with uh, cryptocurrencies as a store of value, but there is, of course, a whole uh, movement to try to uh, tokenize other, uh, other kinds of assets, and this is a very exciting. Um, and there's a further aspect of information about you, or related to you, which is information about you that you've sort of earned or uh, that relates to your, uh, your health and things like that. So your, your educational degrees, the, uh, the things that you've achieved, uh, things that you've you know, paid for, and uh, your reputation, and, and the whole uh, range of medical and, and other information related to your physical presence. And so with this new approach, you should be able to control all of this information through keys that you exclusively create. 
and, and have access to. I think that's a lot of the vision behind blockchain and, and, and cryptocurrencies, in fact. So the real question is, okay, how can we actually make this happen now, outside of store value and on a mass scale? How can we really ensure these, this, that this vision predominates globally for the whole world population, not just those of us who are lucky to have gotten in early? So, to me, the answer is quite clear. We need WeChat as we would say in Hollywood, WeChat meets blockchain with breakthrough privacy. I believe that's the main chance for blockchain to, to uh, really take over, and um, I, I've been dedicating myself to trying to uh, make this happen, and I've put a lot of effort into creating some real technological breakthroughs that enable this, and trying to work with the whole community to uh, figure out best ways to actually uh, make this all happen. So if you look at it from a, say, requirements point of view, consumers aren't going to use a new blockchain-based WeChat if it's like a lot slower obviously. So the time from sending a payment to the finality, when the payment is irrevocable and both counterparties know that, it needs to be on the order of 10 seconds. Otherwise, you're asking people to accept something that's much worse than what they already have and what they expect. Uh, same for, for messaging. Now, I don't want to give the impression that this is some kind of, you know, privacy coin or something, but I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that most consumers would not like to have all of their payments, let alone their messages, published on a blockchain so, and, and transparent for posterity. This is not what consumers expect today. They have an expectation of confidentiality in their payments, and so as not to force, you know, a diminution of what people already have, which would be very difficult to uh, roll out. You, we need to at least match what's available today, and I think probably people's expectations in this regard are going to increase. That's uh, there's a lot of trends around. Um, so, as you know from from Many of you may know from blockchain forensics, there are uh, two issues. One is the linking of your payments to your IP address or maybe your phone MAC address. And the second issue is the linking of payments to other payments. And actually, and most people don't think much about this, even in this space, uh, the same issues apply in messaging. Okay, this is what sometimes euphemistically now called metadata. We used to call it traffic analysis. Uh, it's the most interesting way to learn about people uh, and learn the, their, the social graph and, uh, and so forth, who they talk to and when. Current, current messaging doesn't protect that. Um, but that's okay, we don't have to meet that so that's not an expectation today, but it is an opportunity to exceed current expectations. Now, if we do succeed with a new WeChat, then, of course, we'll have to be able to keep it available as, as the user population grows. And that might mean, for instance, in our planning, uh, a P capacity, which represents a 10x headroom, uh, but of, of about uh, 100,000 transactions per second uh, in the next uh, half year or so um, later, 
this could go, grow by another order of magnitude. So that's a technical challenge, um, but certainly implied uh, by meeting these other requirements. And there's a second thing which is, in my belief, because I've been in payments for decades, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to meet with the whole range of players from, you know, visited many central banks and uh, large uh, processors and, and card companies and, uh, you know, been in the payment space uh, for a long time. And I can tell you that I don't believe governments today would be happy to have a payment system, uh, consumer payment system in their country that would be subject to attack by a national adversary, you know, especially in this environment of cyber warfare and so on. And, uh, uh, you know, traditionally, governments have attacked the consumer payment systems of other governments during war by traditional means, paper counterfeiting and so on. So as a matter of uh, national security, you don't want a system that another country could break. And um, my experience in cryptanalysis, uh, which is mostly not public, but uh, I think it's now public that I broke the, uh, the codes that were used by SWIFT, uh, the so-called uh, SWIFT coder. Uh, and I broke a lot of other commercial and governmental codes back in the day uh, with a white hat on. I mean, not... Uh, not as a hacker, but uh, as a, and then they paid me to fix them in many cases. But um, I can tell you that, that the, the types of public key signatures that are used today are the basis for, for payment security and blockchain probably aren't something that are, uh, that, that, uh, are secure against an attack by a nation state. Um, and so what we need is uh, a mu much more sort of random function type of, of cryptography like hash codes and uh, symmetric uh, encryption. And these will necessarily uh, be able to be uh, quantum resistant, but I'm not saying that we have to worry about quantum resistance necessarily immediately, but we will get quantum resistance as a consequence of using the, the very uh, minimal assumptions of computational difficulty uh, that we can, and that's, that's the prudent thing to do, of course, if you can, you should always do that in security work. So um, basically, the main chance for blockchain to go mainstream is to be this consumer app that has messaging and payments uh, and exceeds what, what can be done today by these you know, proven, very popular, and dominant, and intimately uh, used apps. So, okay, we've solved this problem. As I mentioned, we've made these breakthroughs, and uh, we're starting to engage the community and, and to show the, the fundamental uh, technology and, and work with people to see how to apply it, as I mentioned. Um, you, you know, a natural question is, why hasn't anyone else, can't anyone else do this? I don't know. Uh, apparently not. This is what's needed, plus messaging, plus the kind of new, a new level of privacy and messaging, I believe, and plus quantum resistance. So how is it that we're able to do this? We, this breaks the... Uh, widely known trilemma, for instance. But everyone in the blockchain space that's been in it for a while, I think, had the, had the hope that, and, and the knowledge that this is really what's needed. I've been trying to do it, but no one really has found a way to do it. Why is that? Well, because some fundamental breakthroughs are needed in order to be able to achieve this. I don't see how to do it just by rearranging the currently known and you used elements. So I worked really hard to find a breakthrough technology that 
uh, allows privacy in the blockchain. That's the thing that's missing largely at scale. And we could talk about that in detail sometime if you like. But uh, the way to do it is to, instead of like all current blockchains that use a single node to produce each block, right? Different nodes per block, but each block is produced by a single node. Uh, we use multiple nodes to produce a block, and this is a, a teamwork where each node does a different portion of the effort to create the block. So we choose these teams uh, by a distributed, randomized algorithm uh, according to a schedule that uh, makes it very difficult for anyone to manipulate where they are in, in the schedule. I'm not going to go into all the uh, details, but it's something like, like the approach that was pioneered by Dash and to a certain extent copied by EOS um, in that sense, but it's unique in that a whole team of nodes operate so let me try to give you a sense of how this can achieve privacy by using the silly cartoons, and I hope you'll forgive me, but suppose that Alice wants to communicate with Bob. So she can use end-to-end -end encryption with Bob to protect the message content all day long, but what about the who talks to who, the social graph? How can Alice keep secret the fact that she's communicating with Bob. That's something that's not addressed today. So, by, by messing up. So, uh, the idea here is that we'll have a set, a, ser a team of nodes, and I'm only showing three, and I show them by analogy as, as robots here, and the idea is that they do a lot of work initially to build these physical boxes. So each one makes up its own secret and builds a box that embodies that secret rearrangement of, of tubing. And they seal these boxes up and when the time comes, all the users submit messages in a single batch and the nodes process these very rapidly. And so the messages go through this series of shuffles or reorderings, and now they are you know, rearranged by what we would say is the composition of the permutations. And, and if you need, I mean, if you know what that means, you, you see that uh, the obvious thing is that uh, if, if even if you know some of the shuffles, you, don't, you, don't, you won't know which tube Alice's message came out of if you don't know all of the all of the all of the tubing, right? So the we, that message comes out of the tube and it says in the clear text, "Please deliver this to Bob." But here's the encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted message for Bob, so it can be delivered to Bob, and you know Bob can decrypt it. Also, it's interesting to notice that since we have all this tubing in place, the robots can send an ACK, a little blue check mark, K hey, it was delivered to Bob, back through that same tube. So even though they don't know that Alice sent it, Alice will see that Bob got the message. Another thing is that some of these messages could be payment requests. And instead of being addressed to a you know, particular user, they would be addressed to the nodes and they would be encrypted in a way that all the nodes would have to cooperate to decrypt them and they would see them more or less at the same time. So we'll come to that now. Which is the other fundamental innovation. Remember, we wanted to get rid of the digital signatures per transaction and speed things up and get the, the quantum resistant cryptography. So we had to find a whole new way to do blockchain-based payments. Today, it's always done with, as far as I know, 
signatures by the owner saying, please move money from this wallet ID to that wallet ID. Back in the mid-90s, using technology which I proposed in the early 80s, actually, we did it a different way. It was what we called a digital bearer instrument, a number that was worth money. And so we can apply that approach here to get rid of the signatures and just use hash functions. So let me try to, again, with apologies, get the basic idea, the very simplified form across using this analogy with physical objects. So suppose that Bob wants to receive a dollar, in this simple example, from Alice. So he sends an invoice to Alice. Well, that invoice is actually a hash. It's the hash of a secret, a one-time use secret that Bob makes up. And the combination lock on the, on the outside of the box symbolizes that secret that only Bob knows. And the hash is the number that he gives to Alice as the invoice. So if Alice wants to then pay Bob, she sends two numbers in through the messaging system that I showed you already, which I'm not re-showing here. Uh, this provides a certain element of privacy and mixes the payments with the messaging, which is advantageous from a privacy point of view as well, as you may realize. And uh, the robots or the, the nodes uh, do two things. They look at the first number, which is the secret key that Alice made up when she sent the invoice to Joe to get the money in the first place. And they apply the hash, the public hash function to that secret. In other words, they, you could say they open the check that they can open the combination lock of that, which was previously already on the Merkle tree. And if so, then they transfer that $1 value from Alice's hash to Bob's hash, which is placed now in the proper location on the Merkle tree, and Alice's hash is removed. So the tree only contains hashes that have value currently. That's all you need in the system. And so then Bob could for instance, just look at the hash at the right place in the, at the tree in the right place and see his hash and know that he has the money because only he has the secret key that hashes to that value. But because if you recall the return path through the, the nodes that we use to send the, the blue check mark back to Alice, the nodes can also send back to Alice an actual Merkle signature on the Bob's hash. And then, so there are Lamport signatures on the, on the roots of all the Merkle trees that provided by the nodes. So uh, Alice can then see definitively that the payment was made final and his Bob's hash is on the, on the tree. And she could even then send that signature to Bob. So now the participants have proof of finality without having to burn up a lot of uh, messaging bandwidth or effort. So that's how we can do payments. There's, uh, so we've actually built all this stuff and it's been running for some months uh, in, in, in alpha. We've been testing out the messaging in-house uh, quite extensively. We've, automatic deployment to a bunch of clouds, different clouds and, uh, and so forth and so on. And uh, we have our own block explorer and uh, demos that you could see here of uh, just with three nodes on, on AWS, I think, for the messaging and uh, also the, the, the payments. But I think the really interesting thing is that we have also APIs which run on Android and iOS. And those 
do not use a lot of bandwidth. They don't use a lot of battery because there's very little public key, no per transaction public key. The apps are fast, so it's a, it's a perfectly uh, good consumer uh, application with, let's say, blockchain inside. So we have the technology to do WeChat based on, on blockchain with breakthrough privacy. And I think that's extremely significant and what, what this community you know, could really benefit from. Uh, however, there's one more piece of the puzzle, right, which is the distributed applications and smart contracts, which are related. And so the question is, well, what about those? Well, if you had mass adoption of a blockchain-based payments and messaging system like WeChat, where consumers didn't have to really recognize the, the, the blockchain nature of it, but it had the, the benefits of blockchain, it was easy to use, then what you would naturally expect is that the dApps would run as, in effect, users of this application. That you would communicate with them using the messaging system and make and receive payments with them using the payments facility. That would be the natural integration, like WeChat in China. So how can we do that? Because this would be the most readily available, you know, wide uh, deployment uh, platform for consumers to, to use these dApps. It'd be fantastic for the dApp developers, but we don't want to slow down our, our chain because then it wouldn't be a really consumer friendly app. So we found a way to run the dApps and smart contracts off chain, sort of on their own chains, the chain that's appropriate for the particular smart contract or dApp, using the so-called multi-party computations, which maybe you've heard about and if you can read about them on my website. If you like chom.com, uh, I did a lot of fundamental work on these as well, it turns out. Um, and uh, essentially, you already know about at least one of these because the mixing, which I showed you, is an example of how the secret is divided between those, say, three robots. So they all would have to co conspire or be compromised in order to uh, know who talks to whom. That's an example of a multi-party computation where the secrets are divided. It turns out that you can do this in general. We proved that. You can also do it in practice for a wide range of, of dApps. And I have some uh, extra knowledge about a, a, a reason why this will be possible for essentially all dApps in the near future. Um, but essentially, the idea is that the, the dApp communicates with the chain using a multi-sig, and uh, that allows it to have a presence as a user that is secured by a distributed uh, computation. So I'd like to invite everyone here, the whole community, to join in and help us take the blockchain mainstream. Really looking forward to working with you all to let this technology reach its true potential. Thank you.